going to switch to surface water and reservoir uh, management. Jeffrey Pasek is with the City of uh, San Diego Public Utilities Department. He's the watershed manager there. And um, he uh, has lived in San Diego quite a long time. Uh, he graduated from San Diego State University and um, with degrees in geology and aquatic biology. I like this, that we've got people that, that have this interdisciplinary um, uh, background. Uh, I think it's serving us well. Um, he's worked uh, 35 years um, as a, a biologist um, looking at water quality, but also at, at uh, the reservoir itself. Um, and uh, the biology around the reservoir. He oversees the management of water and other natural resources on 42,000 acres of land surrounding the city's source water resources. And he's also been involved uh, for 20 years with San Diego's potable reuse projects. Um, as part of the Pure Water San Diego team, Jeff oversees reservoir studies and uh, he help guides, helps to guide the program's regulatory compliance. So, Jeff. Um, oh, there you are. Thank you for coming, and we'll talk about surface water now. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about surface water reservoirs and potable reuse. Uh, unlike Orange County, where we are now, in San Diego, just a short distance south of here, we have almost no groundwater basins, um, very small groundwater basins of no significant size, not really viable for recharge with recycled water to, to any extent. So when we talk about potable reuse in San Diego, we will be talking about augmenting surface water reservoirs uh, as our source of supply. I wanted to uh, acknowledge some folks that helped with the work that we've been doing in San Diego on, on reservoirs over the past 20 years. Um, notably, Ahmad Hanoon at Water Quality Solutions, who's done much of the reservoir modeling, and Rhodes and Shane Trussell and uh, Brian um, Pexson at Trussell Technologies, and also folks at Flow Science. So just a bit about San Diego. Um, my agency, the Public Utilities Department, really it's, it's the Department of Liquids. Uh, so we do water supply, wastewater, um, and recycled water. And we supply um, water to uh, about 1.3 million people in San Diego, and we also run the regional wastewater system that collects and uh, conveys and treats wastewater for even outside of the San Diego for about 3.5 million people. So a bit of history to, to bring us to where we are. Um, 200 years ago, uh, Spanish uh, settlers in San Diego built this dam on the San Diego River. Uh, actually, a little bit more than 200 years ago, in uh, 1803. And uh, it was the first uh, European-style water development, water resource development, diversion of water in California. And that water was diverted in this this flume these are uh, hand formed clay tiles about six miles downstream down the river to to the san diego mission and and the uh, areas around the san diego mission to irrigate farmland and then about a century ago between 1880 and 1920 or so san diego it turns out was really kind of a hotbed in in the whole world on on building dams if you look at you know, civil engineering textbooks from 1900, 1910, and you open to the chapter on dams and reservoirs, San Diego will be prominently highlighted. And this is Sweetwater Dam on the Sweetwater River, uh, constructed in the 1880s. O'Shaughnessy worked on this dam as a young engineer. And this is the dam completed just after the turn of the century. So that was San Diego's water supply 100 years ago. Then we moved to the era of imported water, water from the Colorado River and from Northern California, and that now supplies 90% of San Diego's water, 85 to 90% of the water, 10 to 15% is local water supply. And a decade ago, uh, San Diego, principally San Diego, executed some urban, uh, uh, sorry, agriculture to urban water transfers 
uh, two things. You see on the, on the photo there is the uh, All-American Canal from the Colorado River behind the photographer over the horizon into the agricultural area in the Imperial Valley. And it was uh, f constructed as a, as a ditch in the, in the desert. And we paid to reline that ditch to rebuild it with a concrete canal. And we uh, have the water that was saved that was not lost. And we also uh, have secured some water from fallowing of agricultural land. And this is the biggest agriculture to urban transfer of water in the US history to San Diego. 30 days from now will be our next increment of water supply for San Diego, the ocean desalination plant just down the coast at Carlsbad. That's a 15 million gallon a day uh, desal facility. Um, it's operational now, it's going through its final testings and my understanding is it'll be supplying water to San Diegans in the next month or so. So here's a map. This is a map of the, the drainage areas of the Colorado River uh, upstream of our intakes at Lake Havasu with the Colorado River aqueduct coming over to Southern California, shown in gray and the drainage areas of the Bay Delta uh, system and the California aqueduct bringing water down to San Diego and plotted on that map are permitted wastewater discharges from municipalities and uh, industry in those, di in those drainage areas. There's just under 400 permitted wastewater discharges. S and the big ones, of course, are Sacramento and, and Las Vegas, which returns this wastewater to Lake Mead. So I want everyone to know that what happens in Vegas doesn't necessarily stay in Vegas. And so San Diego's downstream of all of that. The idea of having a, a wastewater as part of our water supply obviously isn't new, it just isn't acknowledged. And then that represents, like I said, 90% of our water supply. So it's, it's often said that San Diegans are really cranky about our water, and, and it's, it's true. Uh, this is Jeffrey Mount. Every time I hear him talk, he points out that San, among Californians, San Diegans are the, the crankiest people when it comes to water supply. And maybe this is why. So the future for water supply, the next increment, San Diego's always kind of been out on the front of finding the next new source of water is potable reuse. This is the urban water cycle. Water from homes and businesses goes to a standard water reclamation plant and then to an advanced uh, water reclamation facility. That water will be conveyed in San Diego's case to a, to a reservoir blended with other sources of water and then on to our existing drinking water plant and back to homes and businesses. Now, in Orange County, which has groundwater basins, the groundwater replenishment system takes advantage of that and puts that advanced feed of water into the groundwater basin and then directly uh, pumped out uh, into the system. But San Diego doesn't have that uh, opportunity. So in San Diego, we are all about reservoir augmentation. So our project uh, coming online uh, soon um, will provide about one-third of San Diego's water supply from potable reuse. Phase one to be done by, uh, finished by 2021 from our North City facility will carry that advanced treated water to Miramar Reservoir or to San Vicente Reservoir. Phase two from a facility in central San Diego carrying that water um, probably to San Vicente or perhaps to Lake Murray. And phase three at our South Bay Water Reclamation Facility carrying the advanced treated wastewater to Lower Otay Reservoir. Uh, those, all those increments, our plan is to have them completed by 2035, and that's a total of uh, 83 million gallons a day, which is about one-third of our water supply. These are the treatment steps that we envision, and I'm not going to talk here about treatment, but it's a multiple barrier treatment step similar to what's used in Orange County. And uh, for the Miramar option or the Lake Murray option, which are smaller reservoirs, we would have additional treatment as shown by those additional bubbles in that multiple barrier step. And in all cases, as I said, that purified water will be carried to a reservoir. And that's really what I want to talk about here is, is, is reservoir augmentation or surface water augmentation. So what does a reservoir provide in a potable reuse project? What, what is the purpose, what is the benefit of a reservoir? And this has been uh, worked out and, and stated and restated in many different forms, but this is 
This is my version of it. A reservoir provides time to respond if there is any kind of a treatment upset or, or mistreatment at the, uh, that's a funny word, uh, uh, improper treatment at the advanced water purification facility gives time to respond before that water gets into the, uh, to the drinking water treatment plant and onto the distribution system. The reservoir can provide some attenuation of pathogens, uh, viruses, bacteria, uh, protozoans, principally by dilution, but also perhaps by some die-off within the reservoir inactivation. And the reservoir can uh, mitigate against acute uh, chemical toxins through dilution. But I'd like you to keep in mind these two concepts of time to respond and, and uh, dilution. Time to respond and dilution are the key things that the reservoir provides. A little bit about the reservoirs that we will be um, augmenting with, with highly treated recycled water. San Vicini Reservoir is the largest um, this is a Google image, aerial photo. It's a big reservoir. It's uh, nearly 250,000 acre feet, operates there in the range around 150 to 200,000 acre feet. And for our studies of the reservoir, we're using a, a volume of something like 170,000 acre feet volume as, as the design target. And it's about two and a half miles from that reservoir outlet to the far end of the reservoir. Down south, the, the other reservoir that we're looking at is Otai Reservoir, smaller. Uh, in our, you can see the numbers there, about uh, in the range of 35 to 40,000 acre feet is the operating level. We're designing at 35,000 acre feet. Notice that it's also about two and a half miles long from the outlet to the far end of the reservoir. And then uh, the closest reservoir to the, the advanced treatment plants, one of them is Miramar Reservoir, which we are also investigating, much smaller yet, seven, uh, 7,200 acre feet total, a design volume of about 5,800 acre feet. And it's about one mile long from the outlet to the far end of the reservoir. So these are the three reservoirs that we are investigating for potable reuse. And if you just look at those numbers, you can see that it's about an order of magnitude larger as you go from Miramar to Otai to San Vicente. The other important thing, of course, is that the smaller reservoirs are closer. And, and it turns out the most costly part of, of, of a potable reuse pri project is the pipelines. So being able to convey the water to a, a lesser distance by pipeline can save a tremendous amount of money. That's why we are investigating uh, Miramar Reservoir as an option. So the, the State Water Board, the Division of Drinking Water, has recently worked through with an expert panel um, criteria for regulating surface water augmentation with advanced treated recycled water. And, and these, this is a summary of the two really important points. There are other criteria for the reservoir that are important too, but these really are the important ones. So the idea is that within the reservoir, we'll always see a dilution of 1 to 100 which is 1% of any 24-hour inflow of water as measured at the reservoir outlet. So understand what that means. The purified, I'm sorry, advanced treated recycled water that's going in the reservoir is assumed to be good dilutant water, but at any time, any 24-hour inflow going into the reservoir can never represent more than 1% of the, of the uh, water being drawn out of the reservoir, which means it has to be diluted 1 to 100. Or, same criteria of a 24-hour pulse of inflowing purified water at a 1 to 10 dilution and an additional treatment step, an independent treatment step that provides one log reduction of the pathogens of, 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 that are regulated, viruses, cryptosporidium, and giardia. So that's an or. And the other criteria is the reservoir must have a six-month theoretical retention time, which has nothing to do with the purified water inflow. It's simply the volume of the reservoir divided by the total outflow from the reservoir. It's a measure of the size of the reservoir and the outflow. So that's um, mathematically, it's volume V divided by uh, flow Q. 
has to always be six months or greater. So when you think about dilution and response time or retention time in the reservoir, they should relate to these, these criteria. And that's kind of what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of my uh, presentation. So how, how are we going to demonstrate that our project meets these criteria? Well, in San Diego, our approach has been three-dimensional hydrodynamic modeling of our reservoirs. And to sum it up, we, we this is all done in a computer model with, with very well-accepted computer code. The, the reservoir is divided up into cells. These cells are uh, uh, 50 meters uh, left and right, 50 meters on the XY axis, one meter deep. And then the, the computer code can calculate the exchange of water or energy or constituents among those, those uh, cells. And um, for, if, if you think about San Vicente Reservoir, our biggest reservoir, it ends up there's about a half a million uh, points on that grid. Each cell has 20 neighbors. And the computer, uh, uh, the computer code calculates on a 15 second time step and then the data is saved every three hours. We run our computer models, we've decided to run them for a two year time span. And with the number of variables that we have in the model, 20 or more, it ends up that we generate something like um, 100 billion data points for a two year model run. So it's very computer intensive. And these are the computer codes that we're using, uh, LCOM, you can see what it stands for there, and CADEM. These were developed in Australia, and they, they generally are very well accepted in, in uh, the world of, of, of uh, hydrodynamic modeling. The inputs to the model are shown here. You have to have, um, importantly, you have to have uh, inflow and outflow data and, and meteorological data, specifically wind speed and wind direction, are very important in driving the model. And the outputs uh, are, are here, the, the, the hydrodynamic model outputs of water velocities, temperature and salinity, and importantly, uh, it can, it can, uh, the model can track a hypothetical tracer, which is it's not a real tracer, it's all done, of course, within the, within the code, but it can track the, the movement of a tracer that's released with an, with an inflow of water. And there's also a water quality component to the, to the uh, model, uh, scheme that these, these are the outputs that, that we uh, can work with. So you put together this model of a reservoir and, and you've done all the setup and you've got all that background data, but how do you know, how do you know that that computer code, that model really represents what's going on in the reservoir? What gives you confidence that the model is valid? So we have taken the step of validating our models with, with real-world tracer studies. And I want to make a distinction between real-world tracers, where we're actually adding a, a chemical to the reservoir and tracking its distribution, to the uh, hypothetical tracer, which is generated in the, in the uh, computer code. Because what we really did is um, set up a real-world situation with a, with a, with a real-world tracer uh, and then compared that data to what the computer code, the model generated uh, as a simulation to, to validate that the model was working properly. This is Otai Reservoir. There's 10 sample stations out there. Uh, we used lanthanum, elemental lanthanum as a tracer. Uh, we released 45 kilograms of lanthanum into the reservoir of, uh, over a very short period of time, just a couple of hours. And then at all those 10 stations at one meter increments, we collected samples and analyzed those, them uh, for the concentration of lanthanum. Here we are with the not very sophisticated method of putting the tracer in the water, um, a tank, a pump, and then distributing the, the solution. You can see there's some color uh, immediately where the, uh, the solution is going in. That's because the lanthanum is actually in an acid um, solution. And uh, we did that just last year, and I've aged a lot since last year. <laughs> um, now, actually, this, th these, are, these are sample of uh, uh, the total uh, sample containers from the same tr sort of tracer study we did at, at San Vicente in the 1990s. Many thousands of tracer uh, samples were collected. And I wanted to show you some data from the summer study that was done uh, in July and August of last year. And keep in mind that path along those sample stations from, the, uh, from north, which is upper part of the picture towards the dam, which is the lower part, that's the red uh, path. 
And these graphics, uh, each of these graphics, um, let's see, on the top is the real world measured data at those sample stations and at depths. This is that, along that profile. And the bottom is the computer code simulation of, of the tracer concentrations. And you can see the concentrations are color uh, shaded, uh, the, the, the color ramps on the bottom. So this is just a visual representation of, of validating the performance of the model. And if I just go through these like a uh, animation, just watch uh, the comparison there. So uh, beyond the visual comparison, uh, 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 analysis of variance of this data indicates that the model really is very, ac very accurately predicting the movement of water in the reservoir. So we feel good that the model, uh, modeling work um, can, can accurately predict how a reservoir will behave. So now turning to applying the model at San Vicini, an aerial view of San Vicini, uh, the outlet of the, of the reservoir shown there by the red dot, that's at the dam. We modeled um, various inlet locations for the advanced treated recycled water coming into the, to the uh, reservoir. Those are the four triangles. We uh, looked at three different uh, inflow rates of purified water, which is what we call the uh, advanced treated water. We have four in locations. We, we uh, examined, simulated several different operating conditions, one where the reservoir level is kept relatively stable, one which simulates an emergency situation where the reservoir is drawn down dramatically for about a month and then refilled. You can imagine that would have an effect. And a third condition where the, re what we thought of as the extended drought condition, which makes sense today, where the reservoir over a two year period was drawn down uh, continuously to a very small volume as if we were sustaining the region um, in a period of drought. And we also looked at two different reservoir outlet uh, locations. So there's a lot of variables there. And what we were endeavoring to do was to uh, estimate with the model that retention time within the reservoir of a 24-hour inflow at whatever it is location uh, inlet to the outlet and we are endeavoring to model uh, and predict a dilution of that water at the outlet. And we realized that we really needed to look at the worst case events. It's, it's, not, what ha it's not what happens on, on the average basis is important, it's what happens in the most challenging situations, the most challenging 24-hour event you can think of that's important for the protection of public health. And that means focusing on wind events. So we looked at the, the, data, the wind data and we picked out of the wind data uh, high wind events and wind events that are where the wind is blowing in the direction from the inlet towards the outlet. And that's the, the graph there shows both wind velocity uh, on the bottom and wind direction on the top. And so we picked out certain uh, events, six of them, picked it out of the data. You can see this is for Otai. The, the yellow highlighted are the, the days within the model that we actually released the hypothetical tracer and tracked it. And so um, this idea of worst case uh, uh, scenarios as being the, the controlling factor is, is a key. And then the model is able to generate uh, concentrations of the hypothetical tracer at the outlet. And, and each of these graphs represents one of those worst case wind and uh, other condition events. Concentration of the tracer on the uh, vertical axis and time after tracer release on the horizontal axis. And so if you look across a, a, a line representing 1% of the tracer, that's the target we're, we're, we're looking to, uh, to achieve or, or be better than. That 1% represents a 1 to 100 reduction. And so for this specific uh, scenario, which is um, a high flow rate of 68 million gallons per day of purified water coming in, that extended drought reservoir operating situation where the uh, reservoir is drawn down over two years, and using a, a design, an inlet location, which we called the half design location, halfway towards the dam. In all cases, this, this indicates that uh, it never broke that 1 to 100 barrier. But just to be clear, there were some cases, uh, um, certain reservoir uh, operating situations and in inlet locations, 
where that was not true. So, and, and this is the, the closest uh, inlet location, and you can see that some of the peaks of those uh, d uh, tracer concentrations exceed the 1% or the 1 to 100 target. Um, and this is uh, uh, a representation of that same sort of data at, at several different uh, reservoir, I'm sorry, of, of purified water inlet locations. And so where the, lo where the purified water inlet is located is important in terms of the concentration at the outlet. That may seem intuitive, but it was really uh, beneficial to demonstrate it. So a, a reservoir inlet that's closer to the outlet has higher uh, worst case peak uh, uh, concentrations uh, of that 24-hour pulse. And this is the same sort of data represented just as a bar graph. So um, two different flow rates, a high flow rate in, uh, in uh, orange or yellow, and a lower flow rate of, of purified water uh, in blue. And the more distant inlet locations have uh, higher uh, uh, dilutions, and the closer inlet locations have lower dilutions. And we were able, based on this, to decide to determine that that half design inlet location, the, one, the third one over, would be our target, because we were able to achieve that criteria under, under all conditions on all conditions of flow rate and um, reservoir operating conditions. So all of this work that we did was, was reviewed by an independent advisory panel, a panel of, of science experts, a 10 member panel, and also a four member limnology subcommittee. Uh, several of those folks here are here today. Uh, we, we worked inten uh, intensely with that panel and, and also with uh, staff from Division of Drinking Water present to work through this information. And uh, the panel uh, pretty much uh, endorsed the, the validity, the accuracy uh, of the work. And then recently we've reconvened the panel to consider our Miramar option, which is the small reservoir closer to the treatment plant. So here's the key, key findings for San Vicente Reservoir, our largest reservoir. Um, adding purified water, the advanced tree to recycle water to the reservoir doesn't affect anything about the, the hydrologic conditions. Specifically, it doesn't affect the seasonal density stratification or th thermal stratification of the reservoir. That dilution uh, and retention is a substantial barrier. The advanced treated recycled water will be always be diluted at least 100 to 1 uh, under all operating conditions at that uh, selected uh, inlet location. And I didn't talk much about water quality modeling here, but, but adding the purified water, the advanced treated recycled water, doesn't uh, have any significant effect on water quality. In fact, because the recycled, uh, advanced treated recycled water has so little nutrients in it, it actually reduces algal productivity and the problems that algal productivity presents for a water supplier. But through all of that, we were able to, to determine that the dilution from the inlet to the outlet of that 24-hour pulse will always be significantly greater than 100 to 1. So we're good on that point. But we never were able really come to come to a, 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 a useful metric of of retention time within the reservoir. So we, our modeling work, our studies really didn't define a, 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 um, a useful metric for, for retention. We, t we, we, we considered um, all kinds of different ways of doing that. The model can calculate retention time based on, 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 on the, the period of time it takes for some percentage of, the, of that 24-hour flow to leave. It can be calculated based on, on other things, but we never were able to come to agreement on, on uh, anything that seemed to make good sense uh, from the protect perspective of protecting public health. Now, I'm going to turn quickly to Otai Reservoir. Just remember, this is substantially smaller, about um, 35,000 acre feet in total volume compared to 170, 200,000 acre feet for San Vicente. We examined two inlet locations for the purified water shown there. We just simply call them the north and the south inlet location. The reservoir outlet, you can see there. And remember that, that the, the linear dimensions of Otai, though it's perhaps one-fifth the, the volume, the linear dimensions are about the same as San Vicente. 
same kind of uh, representation of the, of the hypothetical tracer concentrations at the outlet under the worst case situations. And um, what we found at Otai, somewhat surprisingly, is that um, performance of Otai Reservoir is actually better in terms of dilution than, than we saw at San Vicente. And um, here we have a plot of those minimum dilutions that we saw on those, those, very, those six worst case wind event tracer uh, dates. And then this is uh, what we think of as the worst of the worst case data. This is the, the most challenging that we saw under um, two different inlet locations, north and south and under a reservoir volume that's low and median and high. And so, uh, so the, the, the dilutions here really are in the range of maybe uh, uh, high 200s, 300s, up to uh, something like 800 to 1. So the key findings for Otai Reservoir, uh, similar to, to San Vicente Reservoir in terms of behavior, uh, purified water will always be diluted at least 100 to 1 at, at, the, at either location. As I said, the minimum dilutions are typically in the at range of 300 to 1 to 600 to 1. And the worst of the worst case dilutions uh, we found, in the, at least in the modeling, are better than they are at San Vicente, even though it's something like one-fifth the volume of San Vicente. So what's up, going, what's up with that? What, how, how can we explain that? Well, there's a couple of factors. One is that Otai is not very windy compared to, to San Vicente, and so wind mixing is very important for, for this. Another is that the purified water inflow rates at, at Otai are smaller. That, that intuitively, if the purified water inflow rates are, are less, then, then uh, the dilution should be greater. But current thinking is maybe distance from the inlet to the outlet is important because if you, if you consider um, uh, how water is diluted in the reservoir. If the reservoir was perfectly mixed at all times, then dilutions of a 24-hour inflow would be really huge, thousands to one. But the reservoir is not mixed all the time. And so these, these worst of the worst case scenarios really are, are um, short-circuiting events where water is carried from the inlet to the outlet more directly, and the volume of water that's represented there is not the whole volume of the reservoir, it's only part of the volume of the reservoir. So distance from inlet to outlet can be really important. Excuse me. Okay, so Joan tells me I have to stop. So let me just, let me just uh, say this, the, the metric for dilution is at hand. Uh, Reservoir volume is important. Uh, distance from the inlet to the outlet is also important, but that metric for retention time really is not at hand. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. All right, this uh, paper is open for discussion. I think it's interesting that you have the three, you know, really different reservoirs by size, but also configuration. And it seems to me that the geomorphology maybe is, is influencing this. You have that sort of island in the middle of that large reservoir. What do you think are the biggest challenges in going from the smaller to the largest reservoirs in, in doing these kinds of things? Well, the, um the, the biggest challenge will be understanding that retention time and how to put um, how to put a metric to it that makes sense comparing what happens at the advanced water treatment plant to ta retention time and time to respond within the reservoir. And um, as I said, I don't think we have that figured out uh, quite yet. But you're right, the, 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 the morphology, the size, the linear distances of the reservoir is probably more important than we had initially thought. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, John. Thank you, um, very nice uh, presentation. Um, have you thought, or maybe, I'm sure you have, but didn't have time to talk about it, how you put the water in, the top or the bottom, or is there a thermocline? There's other strategies one might use to increase the uh, dilution maybe even yes maybe even barriers so so in in southern in california generally southern california especially uh, reservoirs are very distinctly 
density are thermally stratified with warm water on top uh, most of the year and there's only a short period of time in the winter when they de-stratify so yeah the, the, we had always thought that the purified water the advanced treated recycled water would be discharged at the surface because it is warm and it's low in salinity so it would float most of the time it's disconnected from the reservoir outlet which is deep so that's a, that's a, a really big factor of why it's those wintertime high mixing conditions that are the worst case situation summertime um, the, the, the disconnect between the inflow and the outflow is, is maintained by that stratification. One, one more quick thing is, I think you have to do an integral to get the exit age distribution. You have to I think you have to do an integration and get the exit age distribution and prove that uh, less than 1% of the water has a certain age and then that would determine the dilution. So I don't know you've, if you did that. Just looking at the concentration. Well, we no, we I did look at that, and I okay. and I, I, I that's that's exactly one of the ways that we endeavored to define time is by looking at the time required for a percentage of water to go out the outlet, and we might talk about T5, which is time for five percent of the water, T2 for time to two percent of the water to leave. We can this the modeling work can calculate that, as can real world tracers. Okay, any other comments, questions? Okay, thanks. Thanks Thank very much.